Welcome to our March series of the pasture management program that we've been doing over the uh, the last few months. Uh, it's good to see everyone again, and it's exciting to see that maybe there's going to be some hints of spring on its way. And even though it's officially spring, uh, we're not quite getting all the, uh, the benefits of spring quite yet, but it is early on. So it's, it's good to say and put winter to bed, but welcome spring. So with that, we, we look at where we're at where we're going and how we get there. So once again, our agenda is trying to see what are we seeing out there today? What, do, what are we seeing kind of over the last few weeks to be paying attention to? What are we going to be looking forward to doing over the next month? And then just asking questions about uh, what we're talking about and maybe specifically your situation on your farm. So what are we seeing out there? Well, uh, if you looked out there this past uh, past weekend, you saw a little bit of snow. So winter winter was still thriving. It, it, it went right up to the very last uh, few days. i uh, seeing a little bit of snow. So with that uh, came a little bit of the colder weather and the colder chills. So the, over the previous past week, uh, we saw quite a bit of cooler weather and probably unseasonably cold weather during that time. If you remember back when we started our February presentation, we talked about trying to do some seeding and looking at the best options and talk about rolling the dice, whether you wanted to plant late or plant early. And one of the recommendations was if you were willing to roll the dice, getting it in the ground, knowing that, that summer is going to probably come on a little bit early, typically, then that was going to be your best chance. Well, uh, right now it kind of came into where we rolled the dice and it may not be very fortunate for a lot of us with those new seedlings. They kind of right around that rough timeline of when we were recommended putting it in. Uh, that kind of is when those really heavy uh, temperatures, low temperatures start to come on and sustain temperatures. So if you did plant some, good time to be able to walk out there, check, pull a pocket knife. Uh, if you don't see them coming out of the ground, check, make sure the seed's still in there. Uh, if you are seeing, if you did see some seedlings coming out and now you're not, then unfortunately they probably uh, had a pretty hard time with the, the cold weather. So I'll go out there and check. Uh, if the, the seed hasn't germinated yet with the, with the colder soil temperatures, there's a good chance hopefully that they're going to start to germinate over the next 10 days when we have some of these warmer temperatures. What didn't get knocked at back was, of course, the wheat. They're, they're still coming on pretty star strong. We've got dandelions, uh, buttercups, Pin bit, purple dud nettle, and quite a few other curly dock and things like that. So they are starting to really bloom and starting to go, and they uh, they're going to start to rear their heads uh, with blooms over the next two or three weeks. You're going to really start to see them explode. And then you started to, to look at whether we're going to put in input. Some some started to do some soil testing. We'll talk about a little bit later, uh, but these are when we we started to apply these and make these transitions. So more importantly is, as we look forward to what we're going to be doing over the, or potentially doing over the next month, we're going to be talking about inputs. Uh, we're going to get really more specific into that because I, it's one of those things you just can't elaborate on enough. We control once again, just because that is one of the most important uh, decisions you could make and figure out the strategy that works best for you and your pasture or your, uh, your farm. Is a very important, but weeds are always going to be there. So how do we how do we strategize to control them? We're going to look at reclaiming some uh, winter pastures, some pastures that might have been kind of taken over by by a rough winter of hay feeding, and then we're going to look at a the benefits of doing a year plan. And now is kind of a good time to start to think out and lay out what that year plan look is going to look like. So the first thing that I want to talk about is what many of you are probably are looking at or potentially looking at right now is you probably have one of these situations going on. It may not be over your entire pasture. It may be in a select area where you considered it a, a dry lot. Uh, unfortunately for most of us, it's probably turned into a mud lot, especially after, uh, after recent rains. But either way, it's not real desirable and you start looking at it and it's a uh, it could be a large chunk of your pastures that starting to look like where there's completely bare or you have 
the remnants of a lot of winter hay feeding still left over. What you have in these two situations, uh, in the lower right where you see the horse in there, even though you don't have anything on here, you have a lot of compaction, uh, quite a bit of compaction. So even though you don't have hay, you have quite a bit of compaction. This is probably where the, the, the person may have been feeding hay, and that was where the horse kind of spent a lot of time waiting and waiting and waiting to, feed, to eat hay. They may have been cleaning up the hay, but you saw a lot of compaction here, which you're going to have a really hard time. So we're probably not recommending trying to do a whole lot of reseeding in these areas. But what you're going to have, no matter what, is there's always annual annual things that can potentially pop up, annual grasses or annual weeds. When you get a tremendous amount of compaction, what you really encourage is a lot more of the annual weeds to be uh, germinating right there. So in that situation, you might want to just work up, till up the soil a little bit, try to encourage some other things, break up the that compaction that allows air, water, nutrients to get into the ground and hopefully encourage some grass growth rather than that compaction where you're most likely going to encourage weed growth. The In the upper left-hand corner, you see the remnants of probably concentrated hay feeding. That's probably where most of the hay was fed over the past, past winter. So you have a multiple layers of hay being uh, accumulated in that, in that situation. So what you see on top may 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 or not be dirt. And what happens is it, that hay may be com compacted down into the soil. You might have three, four, five, six inches of that stuff laying there. So what you really have created is a, a rotting environment. So if we wanted to plant any type of seed in there, you're probably going to see uh, that seed rot. Just because you have a lot of that decaying matter, it takes quite a long time for that to decay and become part of the soil. So you, you would you would see probably a poor soil quality right there, as well as um, really a lack of opportunities for things to be planted or things to naturally grow. Um, you, you're going to start to see with that uh, probably a heavy concentration of weeds, spiny amaranth, pigweed would be one of the big ones that you will, you'll start to see, curly dock another one that is a typical compaction hay feeding area. So in this situation, you really want to try to get as much of that hay off. Um, and there's no good way other than to pile it up um, or to take it to the landfill. Uh, it is going to take a little bit of time to break down. But go ahead and get that off your pasture. Work it up again. And this gives you a good opportunity to potentially put something in there or encourage hopefully maybe some summer annual grass growth to start to occur, or maybe some late spring annual grasses to grow. But uh, encourage the right environment to get the right uh, growth going on, and just so you're not necessarily losing what could be a, a large portion of your pasture. So one of the things that I really want to hit home on, and if you take anything out of this entire presentation, this is this is the one. If if you gave me a hundred dollars to spend, and I could spend it on grass seed, I could spend it on um, inputs here, I could spend it on implements. Uh, I would opt to have one thing, and I would take inputs. So getting these inputs correct is going to be worth more than anything else you're going to do. Uh, there's there's other strategies that are going to be beneficial, but until you get this down, and I think we've talked about this uh, more than once, but I really want to hit home on this tonight and today so that as we're going through this springtime, as you're preparing, as you're uh, thinking about what the future looks like, that you start to think about what these inputs do and what the return is for you. So whether you have a really good stand of grass, whether you have uh, are looking to do some reseeding, whether you have a poor stand of grass, this can make a huge difference in what you see by getting this correct over a period of one year. So look in here and you'll see that I have labeled them one, two, three, four. And we'll, we'll elaborate a little bit on that, but these are how I would prioritize them. Once again, you've taken that $100 that you decided that you are going to put it towards the inputs. And then if you had to prioritize 
that hundred dollars by these categories, this is how I would prioritize it by categories. Number one being Lyme. It's, uh, it, it is by far the number one factor in the success of your pasture and the success of your grass. If it's below 6.0, you've encouraged weeds, uh, room sage, uh, a lot of our undesirable plants to start to grow. They, they thrive when the pH is uh, more alkaline. And so right away, if you can get your pH to six, uh, then you're or above above 5.9, then you're in good shape. If you can get your pH to 6.0 to 6.5, then you're really encouraging the grass to grow to thrive. You're also discouraging weeds to grow. So anytime any management that you do is going to really benefit your grass when given the opportunity to, to grow. So this is by far your best return. The only way, as we start talking about the inputs, the only way you can really do this, the only way you can successfully do it is by doing a soil analysis. And you're talking about the cheapest expense that you're going to have in all of these things. Uh, there's not one of these things that, I, that it's worth guessing on because it, for almost every one of these situations, if you're low, you need to make sure that you're, you're starting to lose money by being low or deficient in a lot of these areas. But if you're above area, if you're above some of the kind of maximum amounts, you don't gain any value by adding above. Sometimes you can be detrimental, uh, but most of the time you're not going to gain any value other than it's going to cost you more to do it. So if that's where it's really important to make sure that you're putting on the correct amount, enough to be successful, enough for the minimum, but certainly not going over the maximum. The second one is potassium, and I think this is where everybody started to see that this year, the benefit of potassium. Uh, potassium helps a lot in the, just the general health of, of the plant, but where you see it the most important is in stress. So anytime a plant is stressed, potassium plays a role in, in allowing that plant to be able to survive, especially uh, two examples. When you have an extreme winter event or you have an extreme summer event, obviously Mother Nature gave us in 2022 uh, a little dose of everything possible that she had. She gave us a very extreme winter event for, uh, for our warm season as well as our cool season when temperatures dropped uh, rapidly from the 50s down to zero and uh, with the wind chill even further below that. You saw a rapid decline, a rapid stress event on that grass. During the summertime, we saw a prolonged drought, which affected really our cool season, but even some of our warm season took a brunt of this with um, extreme high temperatures and as well as drought. So we, have a, we had a really difficult stress event two different periods of time. Animals or plants that, were, uh, that had sufficient amount of potassium had a much better chance without, with even less stresses from over, overgrazing had even less uh, stress and were able to mitigate some of these challenges and, and be able to survive. So most of them were able to survive when uh, not stressed, when having the right potassium levels on there. But we, we saw where we lost a lot of uh, grass uh, in a lot of our pastures, and we, we tested quite a bit of, of these areas where it was already overgrazed, uh, but adding that additional stress from being deficient in the potassium and some of the soil tests, we saw a tremendous amount of stand losses due to this. So if you start looking at it, potassium is one of those really key factors to make sure it's correct. So don't necessarily just ignore that every time and, and choose to, to not add that amount when looking at uh, what, where are you gonna spend your money. Phosphorus is number three. I did not necessarily, it's not necessarily number three in comparison to potassium and phosphorus. They're kind of tied, but for our surrounding area, most of our area, we are, have pretty high levels of, of phosphorus naturally. We, Williamson County was mined for phosphorus uh, many, many years ago. So traditionally, we don't have to add a lot of phosphorus or really any because of our such high levels. But for those where you're, where you're potentially deficient or you're baling hay on, on a pasture or a, or a field, you, phosphorus plays a really big role in root growth and development. Um, you have to have that root growth to be able to anchor itself and, and, and then be able to develop while utilizing the, 
the uh, nitrogen. So that's where we start to get that energy transfer uh, with nitrogen. So if you are deficient in phosphorus, that's where if you even apply nitrogen and you're deficient in phosphorus, you're not going to get the utilization near as well with that nitrogen. So uh, it's very, it's so very key is to have the phosphorus, when you have phosphorus, to be able to maximize some of these other inputs that we're going to add, you need to have that. So the, the challenge that we have is that you can add too much phosphorus. Um, so that's why we don't add any extra because with other than naturally in the soil, adding extra does not bind to anything. The plant does not use it, so it doesn't bind to the soil. So if we get big rain events, that's where if you have a pond downhill or downstream from your pasture, that's where you'll get runoff into there with that ex excess phosphorus. And then that's where you start to get algae growth. So if you start to see a pond that's got a lot of heavy algae over the years, it may be that somebody or maybe you have neighbors or maybe you have been applying excess phosphorus and it's not the plant's not utilizing it and it's running into the pond um, and the fourth one is is nitrogen nitrogen is kind of that luxury item it is it is so it is really necessary for getting a much fuller growth a much thicker growth a lot more tonnage to your to your pastures that's where it plays a big role in chlorophyll, which is uh, which is kind of that like green color. That's where you notice uh, plants and that grass that has had chlorophyll or, or nitrogen applied to it, it's a much darker green and much lusher green. So that's where you get a lot of the energy, excess energy density that comes from the plant. Uh, you can catch more energy, utilize more energy. So nitrogen is a, is a great source, but you have to have all the other three, lime, potassium, and phosphorus correct before you want to put nitrogen in. And you want to make sure your situation uh, calls for it too, that you have enough grass to justify it. So it's, it's a very important nutrient for the overall health of the, of the plant, but it is the fourth one that I would add, making sure to get the other three correct along the way. So we did, uh, we, we mentioned this a little bit last, um, in our last session, but spring weed control is here. We talked about early kind of getting ahead of the game, getting some of these weeds with uh, where temperatures were hanging around in the 60s, but we were kind of limiting ourselves to which herbicide application we can do. So uh, when you when you start talking about weeds right now, you need to uh, make sure you understand which kind of control method you're going to do. If you are going to go with a uh, more a conventional where you're not doing any type of herbicide application, this is where you're going to have to do a lot of uh, of mowing and trying your best to to keep those bare spots down. So you may want to till up some of those spots, just trying to keep that 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 weed seed down, trying to pressure it. You can try to, to to put a little bit of a like a ryegrass or something in there if you were just really desperate to get something in. Um, it's going to have a very very short window, so you may not get complete value for that because as time it gets up and going, it's going to start to get hot and die over time. But if you are wanting to go uh, more of a herbicide route, let's try to get ahead of those weeds, then you need to be looking at what your options are. So timing is so important. Uh, our grasses are getting ready to really start accelerating. And so we want to make sure that we, we also stay ahead of the weeds during this acceleration time. They're going to start to grow real rapidly. The picture you see is buttercup. Buttercup is prevalent everywhere right now but it's going to start to bloom probably in mid the first uh, couple weeks of April. You're really going to start to see the flowers really take off when the soil temperature starts to rise. So be very, very, very conscious of that. As you start to make your herbicide selection early on, we talked about only doing 2,4-D ester based on the temperature, um, but you can also look at some of these others now as this temperature is going to start to rise where Duracore, Triclopyr, 2,4-D, plus dicamba. So each one of them has its own benefits as well as its own uh, cautions that you need to make sure you, that you're applying the best one that works for your situation. When you start to look at, and, and we can certainly help each one of you that if you have questions about what, what best to apply for your situation, you never hesitate to, to call for that. 
I always say number one, two, and three, always lay, read the label, read the label, read the label. Make sure you know what you're applying and, uh, and the guidelines to apply it. If you're looking at 2,4-D as one of our most basic herbicides, uh, there's two options, two formulations to pick from, an ester and amine. Ester, since, since the um, Easter is going to come before our next meeting, Easter, ester, you have to use ester before Easter. Easter. Ester is a is a, a stronger formulation of 2,4-D, but it also has a uh, less, or it's a little bit more volatile. So in the heat, in the summer months, it tends to move, displace a little bit more often. So we want to use a much more stable uh, formulation during the summer months, which is why we use a meat. It does not have near the weed control that maybe Ester does, but it is a lot more stable. So that's one we use when anytime after Easter. You need to make sure of your residual. Um, Duracord, Grazon have a little bit of residual, which for the right situation, if you've got your spring of pasture and uh, you know that, that hay and everything you're keeping is at your place, you're not using manure or anything like that, it does a great job because not only does it kill what it touches, but it also uh, may kill a few of those weed seeds that are just starting to germinate over the next 20 days. And then finally, you know, looking at exclusion. So, um, you know, what, what are you supposed to exclude uh, as far as animal grazing or anything like that? Just remember that anytime you see that mostly on a label, that's meant for animals entering our food chain, not necessarily the safety of the animals. So if they are, if it's listed on there, then it is safe for the animals to be on that ground. So if it may list a week to stay off, and then you need to follow that label. The other exclusion is if you're using something like triclopyr, it is a great product as well. Controls a lot of woody stem plants. If you have, certainly if you have some woody stem plants like blackberries and things that pop up in your pasture every so often, this can be a great product to control those. Uh, the cautionary tale for that one is to make sure that you do not spray it on exposed tree bark or tree roots. If you spray it on top of the ground and the tree roots are under it, it's going to bind to the plant and it's going to not have any impact really on your, on your tree roots or your trees. But if you do spray, if you have some exposed tree roots, uh, you spray it directly on a fence row, you may slowly start to damage those trees or eventually kill them. So just be aware of where you're spraying and what you're spraying and always read the label on each one of them. And just uh, the final one down here is know your conditions. Uh, certainly this time of year, that's why spraying in the spring or any type of control during the spring is always um, a little bit harder because we tend to have a few more windy days few more rainy days and so we start to get pinched down and sometimes we'll go out and try to do some control based on when we have available versus when the right conditions are so be very conscious of that especially as we most of us have neighbors um, you don't want to have any type of drift that kind of gets on any of those plants so be very cautious of that and, and very uh, conscious of that the other thing is is um, one of the good things about the uh, this time of year is uh, trying to work environmentally with a lot of our bee population is a lot of our bees are trying to forage off of a lot of our tree blossoms. They tend to tend to want to gravitate towards tree blossoms. And so this is a good opportunity to get out and control the buttercups, which nobody other than a photographer likes. You can't find any animal that wants to eat it um, and nor insects. So controlling those buttercups is a good opportunity as well as um, and then being good stewards and making sure you're sprayed at the right time for our bee population. So as we get to the, the, the last section over here, uh, this is just really a good opportunity, and, and I can't say this enough, is to kind of develop what you guys want to do for your year plan. What What is your plan to be able to uh, work with your pasture. You don't have to have a plan to even do any renovating. It doesn't have to be a planting. It doesn't have to be really anything. You can plan to do nothing, do nothing but have that it's a plan. So when you start to look at it right now, kind of plan what you want to do. Obviously, when we started this, this time last year, uh, you know, I always try to aim towards doing a fall planting. So everything we kind of do works towards 
your fall planting for, for cool season weeds. So you need to take some steps towards that. So it might be setting up a rotational. Uh, if you're going to utilize your, your grasses, it doesn't ha you don't have to have a perfect stand of grass to set up some rotational grazing. Just being able to rotate your pastures at the right time will allow what grass you have there, even if it's just crabgrass, um, even if it's like a voluntary um, Kentucky bluegrass. If you will just rotate and prevent overgrazing during those times, you will be remarkably surprised by the quality of your pastures after a year, just by not overgrazing and keeping them off during the winter. But that takes time to kind of plan that out. The, set, the second is getting those right inputs. We talked about this, but test and apply those inputs and you will be, that will be the second biggest thing that you can do, or probably the first biggest thing, but one of the top three things you can do is rotation and get your inputs correct. You do those things without any other planting. That's two out of the three things that I highly recommend, and we'll get to the, the last one right here. Um, but get the right inputs and rotate, and finally do some type of weed control. It might be mowing uh, consistently. That's better than nothing. Um, it's important to make sure you kind of be conscious of the mowing height, but control your weeds, which eliminates um, you either by herbicide, you kind of free up that space and those nutrients for the grass to grow, or you eliminate them and keep them very, pretty short where they're not consuming so many nutrients. But between doing rotational grazing, getting the right inputs, and doing weed control, even if you don't do anything else, after a year of doing this, you will be really surprised by how improved your pasture is. Obviously, that, that's taking into effect that, that winter is a pretty big role that we have to uh, manage that as well. But those three things. If you go above and beyond that, then you can look at, are you going to plant? Do you want to plant some summer grasses, which would typically happen in uh, May that we're going to talk about at our April meeting? Uh, or are you going to be planting some fall grasses? Are you going to do some annuals like rye or, or, or fescue? But have that target in mind. Um, doesn't mean you have to do it, but be preparing along the way to be able to do that. So next month, we're going to talk about getting prepared for those summer planning. So have that consideration of what you might do. And then towards the end of the year, we're going to try to look at clover to fill some of those gaps that maybe we missed that fall planting. And so, or maybe we are going to choose instead of do that fall planting, we're going to consider doing some clover along the way. That really helps fill the gaps, adds a lot of uh, organic material and a lot of nitrogen. So it's an important thing, but you need to be working towards and plant it because it's not one of those things that you can just incorporate with a whole bunch of other things you're planting and expect it to be successful. And one of the most important things at the end that you have to decide is you can come up with this perfect plan, uh, but if you don't have the time uh, or the labor available to be able to implement it, then we need to come up with a different strategy. So you may want to be able to do rotational grazing, but you don't have the time to be able to do that. And that's, that's just the reality of that, and that's okay. But be, be really honest with yourself about how much time and effort you're going to have to be able to put into this, because that will determine the success and the frustration that you have with your, uh, with your plan. So uh, just take the time to develop whatever that plan looks like for you, be able to reach out to to your extension office, um, to, a, to a neighbor, talk about it and, and be figuring out where your resources are you're going to need to have, uh, whether it's somebody to help do custom application of any one of these things or booking ahead of time to be able to get it there. Whatever that may be, please uh, just work on that plan and be ready to go. And then if Mother Nature aligns with us, then you'll have a good opportunity to, to execute that plan and, and hopefully improve the quality of your pastures. So that will wrap up our session for tonight. Um, our next session is going to be next month, April 26, 2023. We're going to talk about some summer planning. So starting to think about what uh, if we are wanting to do some renovation uh, where we had some of those previous recovery areas where overseeding of or uh, where we had overseeding of uh, maybe a cool season didn't work out, but we saw those areas where the hay was at. We can look at potentially doing some overseeding of some warm season annuals. Uh, we're going to look at clipping and bailing is trying to, um, you know, the heights and things to talk about for that as far as if you clip too low or you clip too high, what are the consequences later on down the year? 
And then we're going to talk about overall quality of the grass and making sure that we're doing the right things to, to maximize the quality of our grass um, so that we can um, prolong it as well as get the best value out of our pastures. Thank you guys and hope everybody has a great night. So we'll